Peace and Shalom Israel. Before we start the lesson, hit the notification button because we upload lessons every week and I don't want you to miss a single one of them. Like, comment, subscribe, and if there's a topic you would like for us to cover, we'll see what we can do. So until next time, cue the music. All praises to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone joining us on this program. This is the Fountain of Israel Bible Studies Program. And as always, it's an honor for me to stand before you. On this particular lesson, we are going to be talking about first the lamb, lion next. First the lamb, and then the lion is next. And I think... What tends to happen is that we look at one of the characteristics of the Messiah and we say, well, you know, Christ is, you know, our Messiah and they see a picture of a little baby, you know, Jesus in a manger or they look at, you know, Christ, you know, on the cross and they see Christ turning the other cheek and they have all these ideas of what the Messiah is like, or at least how he was then. But that is the point. That is how he was then. That was how he is during his first earthly, fleshly advent, okay? That was how he was coming up on the scene of the human experience, where he was a sacrifice. Many lambs don't give a whole lot of fight when it's time for them to be sacrificed. But however, when the lion confronts something, how does he approach? And that's what we have here, brothers and sisters. See, first we had a lamb. And don't get me wrong, he did get angry at some parts well, when he was here. He did turn over the, uh, the money changers um, in the temple. He did, you know, whip people and get them out of the temple, you know, because they were um, disrespecting his father's house. He was. But for the most part, he was... A lamb in that day that was the role that he needed to play he needed to play that role of turning the other cheek he knew he would had to be about his father's business he knew that his purpose was to be the reconciliation between Israel and the father and it required a sacrifice a lamb as John the Baptist would say behold the Lamb of God which take away the sins of the world he knew all of those things had to come to pass. But I ask you, when he comes again, when the king comes again to take his throne, you have to ask yourself, will he be docile? Will he be nice? Will he ask kindly? Will people cooperate with him? And see, this first advent, we have the opportunity to come up under the blood of of the lamb that's everyone's opportunity come up under the blood of the lamb or fall under the wrath of the lion those are the options you see when it says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is lord not all those knees and all those tongues are willing some of them will be doing it by force. Some of them will be doing it because they just simply can't help themselves when it's time to submit. So either we can do it willingly, we can do it unwillingly for a while, but it's probably going to be uh, uncomfortable. And obviously those who are obstinate and those who reject the Messiah will perish. With that, let's go ahead and get into our scriptures today. First the lion, first the lamb, then the lion. Let's go into Proverbs chapter 11, and I only want one verse there. I'll, actually, I'll read two verses. Chapter 11, and I want to read verses 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5. Proverbs 11, 4 and 5. 4 reads this way. 
Riches profit not in a day of wrath, but righteousness delivered from death. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his paths, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. That is us making a choice. That's you and I making a choice of what we're going to do. Whom will we serve and how will we live? Will we live according to righteousness or will we live by our own wickedness? That's the choice that has to be made here. Join me over in John chapter 1. And I'm going to read verse 29. John chapter 1 verse 29, which I quoted a little bit earlier. And he says, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. So that's what this is what we're talking about here. This is what it's all about. The Lamb of God. This is what we this is what we got then, 2000 years ago. OK, this is what we got. But now let's go on over to Romans chapter five. And I'll pick it up at verse 8. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And this and, and, and you know, so many people need to get this in their head. They really need to think about this. They have to realize that everyone has a decision to make in this life everyone all of us have a decision to make in, in in this life what are you going to do that decision is what are you going to do are you going to choose to serve the messiah or not and the the line has been drawn and so few of us realize that the line has indeed been drawn you decide if you're going to serve or not See, those who are, for, for instance, so those who are Tanakh only, they made their decision. I respect them for that. I do. I respect them for that much. For that much, they made their decision. I'm not following no Jesus. For whatever reason, they can give you a, a lot of reasons as to why. I'm not concerned about the reasons. I'm just, I, I, I care about the fact that they have made their decisions. You want to know why? You may be wondering like, why would you say that? I don't understand. You know, you're messianic and you know, they don't, they don't serve the Messiah and all this other stuff. Okay. The reason I say that is because they are not lukewarm. Cold or hot, they're not lukewarm. That's why. They just, nope, not serving. Now, what about us? What, what, what about us who say we believe in a Messiah? See, some, some of those who are maybe modern day Christians. You know, I, some people are, well, you know, you're picking on Christians. Well, I'm not, I, I don't mean to. I don't try to. I'm just saying, if you say you serve Christ, but you don't do anything to serve Christ, you don't prove that through your works, then you're lukewarm. Then you're lukewarm. Or if you make an excuse to say, well, we don't have to, we don't need to prove it, we don't have to do this, we don't have to do I I get that. I yeah, you know, I get that. You know, but it, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments, that whole thing, I could throw that out there. But my thing is, you have to be hot or cold. So if you want to be messianic, be hot. Okay? If you're quote unquote non-messianic, you're cold. But those who are in between, no. He's not, he's not having that. He's not having it. So that's why I say I respect those who've made a decision. People who are on the fence, lukewarm, waffling, I, I don't know. That's not good news for you either. Let us continue. Let's go to Exodus 12. Exodus 12. But let me go, but you know what? Let's finish at verse 10 where we're in Romans 5. Let's finish at at verse 10 for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life because he rose again see now he's a high priest 
First he was a lamb, now he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and when he comes back, then he'll be king. Sacrifice, priest, and soon coming king. Let's go to Exodus 12. Exodus chapter 12. I'll pick it up at verse 1. 12 and 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month of the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto the house take in according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. The lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening and I'm gonna drop down to verse 11 verse 11 says and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and ye shall eat it in haste it is the Lord's Passover for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be for you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So this is what the Lord is talking about, uh, at least being the Passover, okay, when he sends the plague, the death angel. And he said, I'm going to look over you. I'm going to look at the blood and pass over you so that you will not suffer the plague. Now, from the beginning, there was a substitutional atonement, okay? What I mean by that is, when we sin, when man sin, when we sin a sin that is unto death, that is deserving of death, we are supposed to die. That's how you pay. And then the Lord instituted this sacrificial, this, this sacrificial law so that you personally do not have to die. And, and he placed that sin on goats, sheep. Bullocks instead of you. Now, it's supposed to be you or I when we sin. It's supposed to be you or I, but he allowed this substitution. But we are man and that is animal. So when the Messiah showed up the first time, he was symbolic of a lamb. And just as man sin, the most high allowed a man to die for sin. But it was substitutional from the beginning. You can go all the way back to Adam and Eve when he put the, when he put the animal skins on them. Some animal died. They disobeyed God. Some animal died to substitute for their disobedience. No different. Let us continue. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. Now we just come off, you know, a Passover feast on the unleavened bread. So we're at the time of this lesson is somewhere between, you know, Passover and first fruits and Pentecost. Pentecost is not quite here yet, but we have to understand that now we're supposed to live our life a little bit differently. Not a little bit. Actually, you're supposed to live your life without practicing sin. That's technically what we're supposed to be doing at this point. That's what is symbolic of him being a 
Passover lamb, him there being a sacrifice for us. He, or, or, or I should say our Messiah dying instead of us for our sins. And from there, we're supposed to make a practice of getting out the old leaven or purging out the old leaven and walking according to the laws of the Most High. Verse 8, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And that's how it's supposed to be. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. It's how we're supposed to live. And you have to ask yourself, are we doing this? Are, now we, are we now walking unleavened in this life? Are we now doing that? And this is an opportunity. We need to look at this as an opportunity because now we are dealing with our Messiah being our Passover lamb right now and is seated at the right hand of the Father acting as our high priest. This is called an opportunity because when he returns, it's too late. It's too late. So let's continue in 1 Peter. 1 Peter. The first chapter, verse 18, which reads, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So they are equating all this. They're aligning their belief up with scripture and the testimony of Christ. That's what they're doing. They're lying. They're lining it all up. This is how that's what this is what makes them messianic because they met the Messiah. And they're saying this is your opportunity they're telling you and I, OK, the apostles are telling you and I. This is the opportunity that you have. It says, this is the Messiah. Come under the blood of the Lamb. We're going to continue. And we're going to go to Mark. Mark chapter 14. And I'm going to start at 55. Mark 14 and 55. Which read, and the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. Very important to remember that. The lamb without spot, spot or blemish. They could find no cause to crucify this man. Could find no cause. Okay. For many bear fault wisdom against witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. See, they all have said something different. This is a lamb without spot, without blemish. Okay. 57, and there rose a certain and bare false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. So they, they couldn't even get their lie straight. Couldn't even get their lie straight. 60, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? Like, what, what are they saying? Do you, do you hear what they're saying, right? Is this true or not? Are you going to say something for yourself? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of the heaven. And then the high, speed, the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witness? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophecy, prophesy. And the servants did strike him um, with the palms of their hands. You see what happened? That's a, it's a lamb. Okay, ridiculed, persecuted, 
You can go read Isaiah 50, uh, 53 if you want. Ridicule, persecute. You guys get the idea here. Look at the things that happened to him. Okay, and 65 said, and some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him. And let's look up buffet right here. Buffet in the strongs. Kalafizo. Forgive me if I said that wrong. But anyway, it says to strike with the fist. Give one a blow with the fist. To maltreat. Treat with violence. Okay, that is the strongs. Begin to buffet him. Begin to beat, punch, and kick on him. It's like almost like being jumped. A lamb. When he comes the next time, it's not going to play out the way we're reading it right here. Not exactly. Let's go to John. Chapter 19. John chapter 19, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. For that day was a high Sabbath. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true. And he knoweth that he said true that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saying, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, um, Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly uh, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Okay. So that's after it got dark. He told other people didn't see. He took the body down. Okay. But again, we're looking at this crucifixion and we're looking at the very idea that the Messiah is being slain. You're looking at the lamb being played out. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at the lamb being played out, his role. He was supposed to come. He's supposed to do what was done right there. He's supposed to lay down his life as a ransom for the many. And you and I really need to be thankful for that. As Messianics, we need to be thankful for that, that he did that. Thank the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank the Father that he did this. Let's continue. I want to go to Zechariah 12. Zechariah chapter 12. I'm going to pick it up at verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for its only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This is where this... It's where it comes from. And that's why many Messianics believe that Christ is the God of the Old Testament, whom we've all been dealing with the whole time, which lines up with the scripture when Christ said, you have never dealt with the Father or heard his voice or anything. Obviously because it was a representative back then. Okay, it could have been Christ, could have been an angel, could have been that pillar of fire, that cloud, but you were not dealing with the Father directly. Dealing with the Son. That's when all these prophecies are bought. That's when that's when Christ said, you know, you believe Moses and he and the Psalms and all that. You read, they speak of me. They talk about me. If you believe him, you would believe me. We're gonna continue. 
Revelation. Revelation, you're going to chapter 1, verse 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says this, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I'm going to continue. I'm going to drop down to 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. This is why when he comes and he has his gift, his reward is with him. The fact that he can make you and I alive forever. The fact that he can resurrect us with a new glorified spiritual body, still physical, but with a new body that doesn't succumb to age and entropy, doesn't succumb to sickness and disease. That you and I are indeed an immortal. This is part of that gift and that access into that kingdom. Access to the Messiah, the one that did it all. Access to all the answers, to all the mysteries you ever wanted to know. This is part of that great gift. Our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's been revealed unto us. We're still in Revelation. Okay, we're going to continue. Revelation chapter 5, verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the thrones and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And he sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us our unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth for the meek shall inherit the earth and again and shall reign upon the earth it's interesting that it still says the same thing this images and things this imagery here is taking place in heaven and yet the promise is still the earth a new earth of course but it's still the earth is still down here all things have passed and all things have been made new. And this, 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 I think we just have to, we have to wrap our minds around this the whole concept. The great work, this great mystery that is happening, we have to wrap our minds around it. What's happening for us? Let's go to Genesis 49. Let's go to the beginning of the book, Genesis 49. 49. I'll pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 49 and verse 1, which talks about Jacob and he's talking about the things that's going to happen to his sons. But let's take a look at this real quick. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last day. See, so this is important for us to know. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty, 
are in their habitation. So he's 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 telling, you know, he's saying all these things here. He's just letting them know. Okay, so he said that of Simeon and Levi. And oh my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, my honor. Be not thou united for in their angle they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. In verse 7, curse be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Okay, so he told them about that. Now let's go to Judah. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah's alliance wept. Pray, my son, thou art come up. He stooped down. He crouches as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Okay, so let's take a look at this real quick. All right. Shiloh, he, he who it is, that which belongs to him, tranquility and meaning of uncertain. Okay, so he who it is, verse 7. Okay, that was Shiloh, now verse 11 actually. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass coat unto the choice vine he washes his garments with wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes i want you guys to pay attention to that his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk i want you guys to pay attention to that as we move forward okay pay attention to that as we move forward isaiah 63 isaiah 63 Isaiah 63, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 1, okay? Now, I want you guys to notice the transition. Things are starting to change. You've had the lamb. We've been talking to you about the lamb, the lamb and how and how he is and how docile and, 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 and how kind and patient and tenderhearted and turning the other cheek. Yes, that's exactly how the lamb was at the time. And he had to be that way as a purpose. He was also without spot, without blemish. He's also the one whom was sacrificed for you and I, if we choose to believe. But now we're going to start moving into a transition. Follow me. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom, which diet garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, tra traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thy apparel and thy garments like him that treaded in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeem is come. He is coming. You hear an attitude change. The record just skipped right now. Because he's coming, and he is not going to lay down his life. Next time, he's going to lay down his sword for your life. For those who do not want to submit unto his authority those who not would not have him king over them second thessalonian and chapter one I'll pick it up at verse seven and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. How else in verse 8? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming. And he's not happy when he comes back. He is coming. So what are you going to do? What's your decision? 
And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone makes the decision. It's your choice. Everyone makes the decision. But you do see how it's starting to change a bit. You do see how the mood is changing. See how his attitude will be different. Much different. Isaiah 66. Let's go to Isaiah 66. And I, wanna, I want you guys to get this too. I don't want you to miss any of this. Isaiah 66, and I'm starting at verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. What did we just read in 2 Thessalonians? For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. And when that plead, I'm telling you right now, he's not begging. He's not begging people. He's not putting his hand together. Please just listen to what I'm saying. Please. No, 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 no. You and I need to figure it out really, really quick. This picture means he means business. That's what this means. That's what all this is right here. He means business. He's not playing around, not playing with any of us. 17, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind the one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouth shall be consumed together, said the Lord. Not my words, his Lord's or the Lord's words through the prophet Isaiah. Those who want to play holier than thou, those who want to pretend, pretend that they, that, that, that they are sanctified and holy. Get, get away from me, I'm, 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 I'm holy. Those who want to, you, you don't want to be for real with it. You, don't, you, you just want to play with it. You want to just, uh, justify everything that you're doing. And you don't have to do anything different. You don't have to purge out the old leaven. You don't have to walk in a new direction. You do not have to crucify the flesh. You don't have to do anything different. All you have to do is just feel a little bit different. That's it. That's all you have to do. Just feel a little bit different and that's good enough. Forget what James said and proving your faith, showing your faith through your works. Forget that. Forget that. Because, you know, we, hey, we're not going to be justified by that old law. No, forget that. Forget about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. With a picture like this, should you not be in fear and trembling right now? With a picture like this, when he shows up, should you not, should you and I should be a little nervous right now. Somebody should be biting their fingernails at this point, at least. Verse 15 again, for behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, Will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Who is he talking about? Well, he has a few people in mind in particular. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst. That's like you hiding behind this whole lie. The narrative you've been telling yourself. The story you've been telling yourself. And this false picture of who you think the Messiah is instead of the biblical picture of who he is. The biblical picture of who the Most High is or the Son. Instead of submitting yourself to that, you want to hide behind the lie you've been telling yourself all this time. What else are they doing? Eating swine's flesh. Oh, well, you know, don't worry about that dietary law. I don't mean anything. Everything is separated. Now, this is when he comes back. Imagine people going to the New Testament and trying to find somewhere that justify you eating whatever you want. Now, this is talking about when he comes back to on his chariots in a whirlwind with flames of fire to slay people. And he here he's worrying about people eating swine's flesh and the abomination. Anything unclean. And the mouse. 
shall be consumed together, said the Lord. So all of them dying together when you're doing that. Now, he's not just after them. Oh, he's after adulterers and whoremongers and liars and sorcerers and, 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 and pagans and atheists. And he, he, he's, he, he's coming to get all of them. Because the meek shall inherit the earth. They said we're going to rule with him on the earth, right? And he's going to come. He's going to clean house. Clean house first. And then they're going to inherit an earth that needs to be rebuilt. And it'll be starting at Jerusalem. Let's continue. Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. And I'm going to start at 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Did you hear that? And he's going to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. I was just saying that. He's coming to clean house. Verse 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophar, even a man the golden wedge of Ophar. Verse 13, therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. I don't know what word pictures you guys are imagining in your head, but this is not a beautiful day for those who are against him. Those who sin against him. Because a lot of people are going to try to say, oh, well, you said, and they're going to try to find some nice little cutesy scripture or something. Oh, well, you said, well, he said this too. He said this too. Are we just going to go with just the stuff that we like? Or are we going to also listen to everything that he says? He said this too. We have to get we have to get this through our heads, brothers and sisters. We have to get this through our heads. We're still in Isaiah. Isaiah 34. I'm going to pick it up at verse 1. Isaiah 34 and verse 1 reads this way. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein the world and all things that come forth of it for the indignation of the lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies he has utterly destroyed them he has delivered them to the slaughter their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood shall be shall be it's coming Verse four, and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaves fall it off from the vine and and as a falling fig from the fig tree and as a falling fig from the fig tree for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The word, the sword, I should say, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood and it is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorn shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Now, does Jerusalem have a controversy right now? Indeed. In Israel. Because the people whom Israel belongs to are not there right now. And the king of Israel is not there right now. But he's going to definitely come and settle that controversy and i say because he's going to come and set up shop and it begins at jerusalem it begins in israel 
the city of the great king. It's going to start there. That's going to be ground zero. And then it will expand outward. Something that you and I have to catch, brothers and sisters, we, we, got, we got to get this. We got to get this so we can know whose team we're on. We have to understand this. First we had the lion and now there is the lamb, brothers and sisters. We have got to understand this. We've got to get this. Let's continue. Okay, Isaiah, I'll start at one again. Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaves fall it off from the vine and as a fallen fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it, <coughs> excuse me, shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood and it is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and the dust made fat with fatness. Four, verse 8, it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of the recompense for the controversy of Zion. That's what we're dealing with, brothers and sisters. That's what we have that is lying before us. That's what's coming. So we're in Isaiah. Let's go to 31, and I'm just going to read one verse there. So Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 4, which reads, For thus has the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for their noise, for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. So it is going to start at ground zero in Zion. That's where it's gonna start. He's gonna come and start busting some heads. I'm sorry, I have no there's really no point in to sugarcoat this whole thing. 2,000 years ago, they had the lamb and we have the opportunity to fall up under that lamb. Now those, when as he returns and he starts to fight for Zion, they're going to fall under his wrath. You can fall under his blood or you can fall under his wrath. That's the choice that we are all making today. Let's go to a couple of places. Psalm 2 and 12. Go to Psalm 2 and 12. Chapter 2. Okay, verse 12. But you know what? Let's read a little bit more of it. Psalms 2 and 12. Look what it says there. It says, Kiss the Son, a capital S in my Bible. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Kiss the son and put your trust in him. Show some respect. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we had an opportunity to get our act together. We have it right now. Get our act together. Before he shows back up, we have that opportunity. Right? But, if we choose to go our own way, we choose to do something different, then that's on us. Not done. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 5. We go to Ephesians 5. Read a verse right there. Ephesians 5. All right? 
Verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And that's exactly what's happening today. So if you are getting caught up in this whole idea of this, this, this modern Christianity, this Catholic Christianity, this Protestant type Christianity, that takes you from the word of God, that will twist scripture, or don't read it at all, and give you some fun and fantastical story or something, just make you feel good week by week. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to administer truth to you. I'm trying to give you Bible truth. You can feel however you want to feel about it. But what happens, what was happening normally when you were going to church? What was the reason back then that you really didn't want to go, some, those who didn't really want to go because you felt like, hey, it was the same old thing. They told me the same old thing. They give us the same old song and dance. Or those who did love it a lot. Where'd you go? You went to catch that feeling again. You went to hear that music and let it just stir up your spirit. But where are you getting truth? Now, far be it for me to poo-poo on music and stuff. I have no problem with music. I love, I like music. Okay? Love music. No problem. But you're supposed to be fed with truth. Fed and put on the whole armor of God. You're supposed to be getting girded up. You're supposed to be covered in the armor of God. You're supposed to be covered in His truth. Bathed in His spirit. You're supposed to be getting understanding. And not just theatrics. We get caught up in the theatrics all the time. And we keep thinking that the Messiah is going to be some docile, you know, nicey, nicey, turn the other cheek. That it's over with. That, that part is gone. It's over. He's loving and forgiveness, forgiving right now. What about when he shows back up? What about that? Now, you and I may be asleep by the time he comes back, maybe, but when, when he, when you, or when he wakes you up, you better hope it's the right resurrection. You better hope it's the right one. Revelation 14 and 10. Revelation 14 verse 10. <sighs> Look at what happens, people. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of his lamb. There's no other way to put it. How can I nice that? How, how, how can I sprinkle a little Jesus on it and make that all nicey nicey for you? How, how can I do that? How can I possibly do that? Let's go to John 336, please. John chapter 3. Let's read this. I'm gonna start at 35 though. The Father loved the Son and has given all things into His hand. Understand that first and foremost, who's going to be in charge and where He gets His authority from. 36. And he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believe not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So if you choose not to believe the Son, that's totally fine. Your choice, hot or cold, is your choice. Totally fine is your choice, but all of our choices have consequences to them, right? This is what we teach our children. All of our choices have consequences. So keep that in mind. Ezekiel 25. I want to read verse... 17. Ezekiel 25, 17, which reads, I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon thee. <laughs> Makes me think of that scene in Pulp Fiction uh, when Samuel Jackson said that when he was quoting this Ezekiel 25, 17. 
Furious rebukes. Let's look up rebuke real quick. In the Hebrew, rebuke. Tukeka. Okay? Rebuke, correction, reproof, punishment, chastisement. Argument, reproof, argument, impeachment, reproof, chiding, correction, rebuke. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebuke, furious correction, furious chastisement, furious punishment. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. Brothers and sisters, he means business. What else can I tell you? He absolutely means business. Let's go to my last two places. Let's go to Psalm 75, if you will. Let's go to my last two places. Psalm 75. And I'm going to read verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture and he poured out of the same. But the dregs thereof and all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. It's that cup mixed with his indignation and his anger that we read over in Revelation. He was pretty upset. Pretty upset with his people and so he's in a lot of the punishment of his people here and now. A lot of Israel have gone astray and a lot of them have been punished and a lot of them are being punished and a lot of them are living under a curse. There's a time where the curse will be lifted, the punishment will be over, and then he's going to be dealing with the other people. Especially those that know not God. God, especially those who believe it in a lie. Even those that punish his people because the punishment is over. It's, it, it's going to come to a close. And yet, other people, other nations want to further the affliction. Let's go to our last place. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. And let's begin at verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. And even as a fig tree casted her un untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven de departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were removed out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And who shall be able to stand? So I asked a question, brothers and sisters. What are you going to do? Where do you stand? You and I have an opportunity right now to get our act together personally because it starts with us. And we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And for one, we can start in our home. We can be men and answer the call that the Most High has put on us to be men, to be the head of the house and to provide and protect and to execute the vision that he put on us. We can do that. We can be husbands and we can love our wives and we can love our children. And as wives, they can submit and show reverence to their husband and love their husband and do everything as if they're doing it unto the Messiah. All of us. And then we can let that and we can love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We can, we, we can do that. We can love God. We can love our neighbor. And we can let that spread from our household outward. 
because that's how it's supposed to to be we can show due respect to one to another and we can come together as often as possible to break bread with one another or at least to memorialize our feast days or we can simply bicker and fight deride and chide one another and not take this thing serious play around and think and live as though we have all the all the time in the world or we can be sober minded and we can get serious and we can look at our actions and we can look at ourselves and we can look in the mirror and we can tell ourselves look you know it's really really time for me to make a serious change because I don't know when I'm going to go to sleep and wake up again and if I am awake when the king comes well I'll be ready the fact that you have breath right now in your body the fact that you have hearing or eyes anything that's going to help you understand the message and understand what's going on it's an opportunity it's an opportunity for you and I to start in such a way that is pleasing in his sight and it behooves us to do so because the king is coming and who shall he find so doing I hope this message has been edified to someone so until next time search the scriptures and prove all things peace and shalom Israel